Hello, good afternoon. I don't know if you're hearing me right now. Just let me know through the chat, please, because I have some trouble. Thank you very much. We had some trouble right now to go live, but it's uh, it's working right now. So uh, good afternoon to everybody and everyone who will see us in the recorded version. And today we will receive uh, John Hall. Uh, John, how are you? Just put your camera and microphone and come here on the stage with with us, with me, in this case. So uh, we are here at uh, four o'clock in uh, Central Europe time, and we will receive to John. John, how are you, John? I'm fine, thank you. I can't. I can't see the stage to move onto the stage. It's kind of blocked by everything. Yeah, and I, I had a, a problem to, to put my camera and to put my microphone. Uh, I will check later with the platform to see if there is any trouble. Uh, but now you're on the stage with, with, with me, uh, okay. with everyone. So, John Hall is a board chair of the Linux Professional Institute, and he will be talking about starting your own business with free and open source software this, uh, this afternoon here, or this morning for you uh, right now, because maybe it's uh, 10 o'clock, 9, 10 o'clock? 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock is fine. So, thank you to be here today okay. uh, at 10 o'clock. So, if you have any question to John, you can ask through the Q&A or uh, at the end of uh, this conference, you can raise your hand and uh, we will invite you to come on the stage. If it's working, uh, I hope it will work and, and come on the stage with us. So, I will, uh, Okay, I will explain that I will be talking with a full screen, so I will not be able to see questions during the talk, but I will end after 35 minutes and give time for questions. I will be here to, to ask you a question. Don't worry. Okay. I will ask all the questions at the end of the presentation. So okay. just go on, take your time, take it easy, and thank you very much again to be here sure. today. You're welcome. Okay, the title of my talk is Starting Your Own Business with Free and Open Source Software. And I will say from this slide, first of all, I'm not going to say every word on every slide because I have a lot of slides and a limited amount of time. So, but I am going to go over some slides and you can ask me some more questions at the end and I will make sure that the slides are available through the conference. For those of you that do not know me, I've been in the computer industry for about 50 years. I've worked in a wide variety of different systems. I've had a lot of different jobs, a broad spectrum. And one of the things I like to think about myself is that I am pragmatic, which means I try and get the job done. I don't, I'm not very religious about any sort of things. I believe that even though I believe that free and open source software is the way of doing things, I don't necessarily spit on anybody for having closed source answers. That's really up to you. I am the board chair of the Linux Professional Institute. We are a nonprofit international organization based in Canada, and we promote open source professionals. Uh, we've been in existence for about 20 years, and up until this point, we are mostly known for our certifications, certifications of people with different skills. We have an open process of creating these certifications and we list our objectives on our website. They're very visible. We have about 160,000 certified professionals in 180 countries around the world. We've concentrated so far on GNU Linux Systems Administration and we're branching out into BSD and open source programming. We live in interesting times. In case you haven't noticed it, there's a global pandemic going on, uh, which is causing a worldwide economic crisis. Some companies are failing. Some companies are simply laying people off because they don't have business for them. They have no way of paying them. Um, and some companies are reinventing themselves into new ways of doing business. So this could be the time if you are laid off, 
or if your company is trying to restructure, to think about what are my skills? What do I have? What can I do? And from that, maybe even think about creating your own business. Now, I've been talking for many years about computers and software and things like that. And about 15 years ago, it occurred to me that nobody ever really buys a computer. They don't buy hardware. They don't buy software. What they buy is a solution to a problem. A person has a problem. They need a solution to it. And it just so happens that maybe some hardware and maybe some software will help them with that problem. And if that's the case, then a lot of times the customer doesn't care what the solution is. They don't care if it's this type of system or that operating system or whatever. All they care about is that their problem is solved. And so even if your problem is playing a game, that problem is the problem you're trying to solve, not whether it's created by this type of computer or that type of computer. So some other interesting thoughts for people is that in industrialized countries, and we're talking now about uh, non-agricultural, non-governmental business, about 86% of your gross domestic product comes from small to medium businesses. Now, in the United States, those small to medium businesses are between 1 and 50 people. That's small. And medium is between 50 and 500. In other places around the world, they may think of a small business as between 1 and 30 people and medium between 30 and 300. But no matter what the range of businesses is in people, about 86% of, of the country's wealth comes from those small to medium businesses, not from the large companies. About 90% of all intellectual property, as measured by things like copyrights and, and patents, come from those same small to medium businesses. And we think a lot about things like Apple and stuff, and we say, oh, my gosh, they innovate, they innovate. A lot of times the innovation does not come from them. They simply buy it. They see something, they buy it. Somebody comes to them, they buy it. And because of this, about 50% of those small to medium businesses disappear, particularly small businesses, disappear after about two and a half years. They develop their thought, they develop their product, and they sell it off. Or perhaps they go out of business. But the thing is that not all of this is bad news, because if they sell it off, they obviously make money. And even if they fail at business, they have employed people during that time, they've paid people wages, they've given people jobs. So this could be the time to move your path forward, to plan for going forward to take stock of what you know and what you can do, to also think about what you have done and write that down so that, you know, whether or not you're trying to convince your management to keep you on board while they're laying other people off or whether you decide to go out and go to another company and try and convince them to hire you or whether you just say, hey, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to create my own business. When people come to me and say, Mad Dog, what should I be doing in free and open source software? What should I be doing? One of the things I ask them is, what is your passion? Do you like music? Do you like cooking? Do you like cars, automation? Out of that, you could take your secondary passion, or maybe your first passion, and think about starting a business along the lines of that passion. You should also have an idea of where you want to go, because if you don't know where to go, then how are you ever going to know how to get there? So these are the types of things that you should write down and you should think about them now. So as the opportunities come forward, you're ready to be able to go after them. And while you're doing that, you can think about the other people, perhaps in your area, that have the same passion because those might be people that you would want to invite into your company in the future. Now, many resources are free or online, or both, that you can go after to help you plan your business, to help you get your training. 
one of the things I'm proudest about the Linux Professional Institute is we only do certification. We do not do training. We partner with people to do training. But you could also get your training through your own efforts. You could read a book. You could practice. You could go to the Internet and find information to train yourself to meet the objectives of our different certifications. So I remind people that there are libraries that have books on various topics. There's lots of free stuff online. But also, there are groups who have retired executives like and or active executives in places like the Small Business Association or the Rotary Club or other types of areas that these people can give you ideas and help in how to start your business. So please don't be afraid to ask them. It can't do any hurt to ask them for advice and stuff like that. And a lot of these people are perfectly willing to give you the advice for free. So let's say you now have an idea for a solution that you would like to create a business around. You have to create a business plan. You have to think about it. You have to think about whether your business is going to be a service or a product or a combination of both. And you have to figure out how you're going to make money out of that. Now, it could well be that, you know, you have a completely free and open hardware and software solution, and you are going to be making money about a certain particular type of service. It could be that the bulk of your product is free and open, and you have tiny little incremental pieces which you may be getting your revenue from. These are all the types of things you have to think about, but if you don't understand the size of your market and how much revenue you're going to get from each part, you could well go bankrupt. You have to think about your competitors. Who are they? Where are they going? And you have to think about why somebody should buy your product and services. You have to think about the scope of your sales area. Are you going to try and make it international? Are you going to make it local? Lots of people can have very, very good businesses doing stuff on a local basis and grow their business over time. What is the cash flow? You have to understand that before you start selling anything, all of your money is going to be going out the door in various type of expenses. So you have to plot that out with what we call the burn rate, how fast you're spending your money, and then think about your revenue rate. When are you going to start to be able to sell things? And at what rate is your, is your revenue going to start coming in? When your revenue is, of course, below your expense rate, you are in danger of going bankrupt. We'll talk more about financing later. But as soon as your revenue crosses that expense line, and assuming that you continue your revenue going up and your expenses are kept under control, now you are profitable and your business can go on indefinitely. To all of this, you have to add a marketing and manufacturing plan. Now, in all of these plans, they're not cast in stone. They can change over time. You don't expect that they're always going to be the same. These are living documents. But without them, it's like trying to drive between two countries with no map. You can't, you, it'd be very difficult to get there. So you need to have these plans to show you how you're going. The next thing you might want to do is think about licensing strategies. Now, I'm a free and open source type of guy. I like open source or free software licenses, but there are also closed licenses. And you have to think about how you're going to license the code and the things you develop, whether you're going to take out a patent on them. And a patent isn't necessarily a bad thing, because if you have a unique idea, you can have a protective patent that allows you to keep other people from patenting your idea and keep in, which which may prevent you from using your own idea another way of preventing that is to publish what you're doing so that people can see what you're doing and in the future if somebody tries to patent that idea they are blocked by the fact that this is what we call prior art, 
and that it has been published. The publishing also gives more visibility to you and your company. And we'll talk more about that later too. Another concept in licensing is what we call loosely coupled. I asked Richard Stallman about this years ago. What happens if you take a GNU Linux system, you put it inside of a box along with an Oracle database engine, which of course Oracle is closed source, and you then put some applications on top that are also either closed or open source, how does that go together? And he says, oh, that's easy. That's what we call loosely coupled. That the things that are open source covered under say a GPL license, you point that out, you, you point to where the people can get the source code for it, but you do not have to, of course, point to where they get the source code for Oracle, nor do you have to get you know any other non-free software uh, distributed. Then there's dual licensing. This is very important, and it's very important when then when you start a company that if anybody is writing code for you that you're going you want to license yourself, you want to be you want to be able to assign the license to, that you get them to assign their copyright in their employment contract or whatever, assign their copyright to you so that you are now in control of the licensing for that particular piece of code. It doesn't mean you have to make it closed source. In fact, it allows you to have flexibility in your licensing so that you can say to people, oh, if you're willing to follow the GPL, then you could have a GPL license. But if you want to take this code in a more permissive licensing, like BSD or MIT, we can sell you that license so that you can then keep change the code and use that for your own use. So dual licensing allows you to have different licenses to different groups of people. You have to think about what is the organization of your company? Are you going to be a nonprofit? Now the Linux Professional Institute is a nonprofit company. We do not have shareholders. We do not give out profits to people. We take all of the money which we get and put that back into the organization or to doing open source projects for the community. But we do have stakeholders, people that are affected by what we do. And those are the people that have our certifications. That's the open source community in general. It is a nonprofit. But of course, you could be a for-profit company. And now, what is your ownership? Are you the sole owner of that? Have you put in all the money and everything and you don't owe any of the company to anybody else? Perhaps you have a partnership, one or two other people. Or you have a corporation where you have stockholders. But the general picture of a corporation, particularly in the United States, is somebody who is the president, somebody who is the chairman of the board, you have a board of directors, and then you have lots of stockholders. But an alternative type of corporation is one which is a cooperative where you have it's either owned by the workers themselves or it's earned by the customers i prefer a worker-owned type of cooperative and a worker-owned cooperative has the advantage that the workers get to be able to say where the corporation is going and what the corporation is doing and they do not distribute the profits to a bunch of stockholders. I believe very strongly that the cooperative gives a much better worker type of situation. And there's been time and time again where companies who are going out of business were sold to the employees and the employees turned the company around. In any case, you also need to think about a board of directors, people with different skills coming in. They may be paid, they may, not, may be non-paid, but they helped you to give direction to either the corporation as a profit-making corporation or a cooperative or even a nonprofit. Think small as you start out. This is, should be fairly obvious because setting up a large company can take a long time and a lot of money, which you don't have. Think about something which, for example, in Brazil is called a micro-entrepreneurship a one to two person company 
that gets the company started and uses a lot of services which could be purchased instead of hiring employees, which you have to have a long-term commitment to. The services may be, it may seem to be very expensive, but the advantage of it is when you don't need those services anymore, you can let them go. You can terminate the contract and that saves you money in the long run. Now you need to think about a prototype. And this is where free and open source software and hardware really shine. You, as you start to think about putting together the prototype for your product, try and stick with standards so that your project can be flexible and move across different avenues of software and hardware over time easily. If you're gonna be using FOSS, you need to understand the licenses really well so that you know what licenses work together and what licenses don't. What you can do with your software. People have been sued for misuse of their FOSS licenses. Free and open source software is not the same as public domain. There are requirements of the licenses. They may be very small, but you still need to do them in order to be compliant with the license. You get your prototype working so that you can show it to people. You can show it to potential customers and say to them, how does this look? Does this, is this what you want? Does this solve your problem? Does this, is this your solution? You need to do that under a non-disclosure or confidentiality statement with the customer so that they don't talk about it to potential competitors or things like that. But this is the best type of feedback that you can get, and you can get that when you have your prototype working. If you go out to SourceForge, GitHub, or GitLab, or any of the repositories, you find out that today there's over 430,000 different projects out there, databases of all sorts of different things that are now developed by over 26 million developers who are developing code that you could use in your solution that you're gonna be selling to customers. And that's a pretty big development force. And people say to me, oh, Mad Dog, those people don't do development all the time. They're part-timers. And that might be true. But on the other hand, if you go to a company like Microsoft, you don't expect that all of their employees are software coders and that all of them are working all of the time. They have meetings. They go on vacation, you know. And some of them work in the cafeteria. Some of them are security guards. So this is really a huge number of developers and projects which you can pick to be your solution for your customer. And speaking of places like GitHub and GitLab, as you start to develop your company, think about creating the support mechanisms that you're going to need in the future. Are you going to allow your customers to download bug fixes and updates to your programs and things like that, you need a download area. Are you going to, do you want to have your customers give direct input into problems that they're having and getting results back, you need a bug tracking system. You need to have a place to have news of the project and stuff, particularly before you start shipping and you, you know mailing lists and things like that. These places are places you can put this type of information. As you're creating your prototype, think broad and think about the types of things you wanna put into it and think about the many types of solutions which are out there in the free software space. If you're talking about databases, you have databases like you know traditional ones like MySQL, but you also have Postgres, you have Firebird, you have CouchDB, you have all these different types of databases. And you even have data structures you have libraries that help you implement linked lists and hash tables and things like that. So become familiar with all of these and pick out the right one to do your prototype with. Geographical information software, all sorts of mapping software, open mapping data and things like that that can be made to use your prototype to make your prototype more accessible and more useful to your customers. Graphical tools for creating artwork, backgrounds, things like that, they're all free. Why should you have to pay for Adobe anything, right? Audio tools, CAD tools, the list goes on almost indefinitely. 
you also have uh, you also have to start to think about manufacturing. Are you going to have a distribution of your product? Is it going to be wide or is it going to be narrow? You have to set to start to set up the infrastructure of your company. Uh, you could build a website, but if you build it, please build it inside of a container or a VM because you want to be able to start on a small server and then be able to grow it easily over time. You want to be able to translate it to perhaps a larger or more inexpensive server or system as you need it in the future. I can recommend uh, FOSS-based uh, uh, CMS systems like Joomla or Drupal, but please make it lightweight and fast. Too many companies have a very fancy website that when you're trying to render it on relatively slow internet lines, it takes forever. You want to be able to have your, your site be very fast and allow it to get to the content that the customer really wants as soon as possible. You can use Creative Commons media for content. Why should you have to pay for pictures? Why should you have to pay for music? Why should you have to pay for a lot of other things when you can find things under Creative Commons that you can use freely in your, in your site? You notice at the bottom of every slide, I have a Creative Commons license, which says that you're welcome to give this talk as long as you use it in total and you give attribution back to me. For anything else, you need to come back to me. If you say, well, I want to use the slide, just this slide, and then you come back to me and I say, okay, you can use that slide. But if you want to use the talk in general, you're perfectly willing to, I'm perfectly willing to allow you to do that. You have to think more about marketing, more marketing. And social media, of course, is your friend. Uh, today, marketing through Facebook, marketing through LinkedIn, marketing through all these other different types of social marketing things, perfectly acceptable, and it's, for the most part, free. But you should also, at this point, start to think about crowdfunding. Think about it early. It takes a lot longer to do crowdfunding than you might think. And having a working prototype when you get to crowdfunding is extremely valuable. Number one, it gives you a much better way of knowing when you'll actually be able to ship the crowdfunding things. And it also encourages people to invest in the crowdfunding because they see something that is actually working for the most part anyway. Then you start writing articles and blogs about your product, about your ideas, about what it can do, and start attending conferences and giving talks, particularly if you're using, if it's gonna be an open source project. This allows you to pull in other people who might be able to help with your project or your product over time. Let's talk a little bit about raising capital. Beware of losing control. I've seen so many companies over my 50 years in the industry go out, they had a great idea, they had a great prototype, and they went out to try and get money to help them grow, and they lost control. There's various types of investors at various times of the company. Angel investors are people who typically come in first. They say, oh, yeah, okay, it's a high risk type of thing. I understand that. I Here's some money. I expect you to pay me back in a short period of time with a high interest rate because this looks very risky, but it's only for a short period of time. So the total amount of additional money you pay me is usually fairly low. These aren't necessarily bad because the angel investors usually take interest in your company and say, okay, here's some valuable input to make your company more successful. Then you have the next level, which I call vulture capitalists. And these are people who say, okay, you've got the prototype. There's less risk to this. I'm going to give you money over a longer period of time. And they do. But if you ever have to go back because you ran out of money and you need to have more money to keep you going, the venture capitalists can work, can pull levers 
so that eventually you lose control of your company. Orig originally, the venture capitalist may ask for 10% of your company. And then a little bit later, if you have to go back, they say, oh, okay, well, you, you had to go back. Now you're going to have to give me 40% of your company. If you have to go back a third time, you almost always lose control. So be very careful of venture capitalists and how much money you lose and make sure that you get enough money from them if you go that route to be able to take you to the point where you are profitable. Another way of raising capital and very effective for small companies is bond sales. Selling a bond to friends and family. This, this bond does not mean that they own any part of your company or have any control over your company. It simply is a loan. And over time, you pay back, you, you pay the interest on the loan and you can pay back the loan itself, in which case you own the entire company. And a newer method of raising money is, of course, crowdfunding. And this is a way, you know, Indiegogo, Kickstarter, stuff like that. If you have a good idea and a good prototype to show people, you can go into crowdfunding. I've, I've been in crowdfunding uh, examples where it's taken a year or two years for people to create the product of the crowdfunding. I've had a couple of them that have failed and that's a risk I took, knowing that they could fail. But usually crowdfunding, particularly for small projects or small things, is a good method of doing it. You can offer other compensations to potential employees and people contributing to your product other than money. Sometimes you can say sweat equity. People are working, they're contributing their time and effort and stuff like that because in the future, they may become a full-time employee. Or they could, you know, have some type, other type of ownership of the company. You could give out token payments and say to them, understand, I can't pay you a lot of money. This is particularly uh, effective for board members who are going to be giving you expertise, particularly in business, and some types of technical expertise. People who like working on your project because they have a passion for it, but you can't afford to pay them full-time rates. Also hire consultants rather than employees. Many times it's very difficult to get rid of an employee, particularly if, if they're in an organization like a union or trade skill. But it's, this is a trade-off of expense for the immediate need versus time to market and getting things out the door. And, and if it's salespeople, you can talk about commissioned sales so that it's incentive for them to sell more things. You may have to have a mixture between paid salaries and commission sales, but the bulk of the work should be commissioned to encourage them to work harder, to make more sales, to sell your stuff. You have to think about other infrastructures such as trademarks and logos. Lawyers are expensive. So as much, doing as much work as you can, reading as much as you can about trademarks and logos and how to use them is important because the more you read and know yourself, the cheaper the lawyer can become. You should plan for things like your top level domain name or your secondary le level domain name and make it memorable. It used to be that you had all sorts of People who would say, oh, I'm going to have an info and I'm going to have a .org and I'm going to have a .com and I'm going to have a .net. I'm going to have a, that's a bad way of doing it. Put all of the services underneath one TLD or SLD and focus on that. There's a lot of free services out there that you can utilize once you have your TLD or SLD. Take advantage of them, particularly in the first stages of your company. I knew a company one time, I won't mention their name. They had a huge amount of funding. They were very big in the Linux space, but they spent money like there was no tomorrow. They spent money on very fancy offices, fancy furniture, all sorts of stuff. And they eventually went out of business in the dot-com boom or dot-com bust. 
be frugal. Work from home. Meet your investors on their space. You don't have, you know, go to them. They don't have to come to you. Look for incubators in your area that help you with physical needs like printers and stuff like that. You know, 3D printers, make it labs, all these type of things that help you without having to put out your capital overlay. So up until this point, we've been talking about the company. We've been talking about the software. And one of the things we should also talk about is a little bit about hardware. These days, you can have many different types of little computers to help you with a product or even in development. You know, of course, the Raspberry Pi is the most famous, but there's lots of other systems out there that have, this, that have different capabilities, different price levels, and you should investigate them as you start to think about your product. If you have to create your own product, there's lots of free tools these days like KiCad, like Spice for, emu uh, for circuit simulation and emulation. There's lots of different CAD tools. Once you've developed the design for your system, you can take it out to a printed circuit board foundry and they can create the printed circuit board for you. And oftentimes they can also even manufacture the first few prototypes for you. These are typically fairly expensive to do in small quantities. So you really need to plan and test a lot of times, very, very hard, a lot of times before. Here are some quick examples of some products that you could put together through hardware and software. You've seen them every place, at McDonald's, at Burger King, at the, at the grocery store. They're called a point of sale terminal. They're usually made up of an LCD screen, a keyboard, a mouse, a scale, a scanner, a cash drawer, a printer. They're the things that, that crack up your sales and give you the receipt. These are very expensive, put out by companies, but you can replace them through software called Udo with a single board computer and a lot of peripherals, and you can sell services and, and training on those devices as well as the device itself. You've gone to the store, you've seen smart TVs from Samsung and others. A lot of times they use software known as Kodi. It provides the bulk of the software there. You could do the same thing. You could put it together and you could tailor it to exactly what the people want. Here's an example of a very simple Kodi system as a multimedia system with a little set of speakers. You could put a webcam on top and do security with it. Freedombox.org is a secure server that allows you to store your most secret of information. You can run off of a lingual single board computer. You can sell services set up and a lot of other things. So in summary, what you have to do is you have to plan, plan, plan. You have to, don't be afraid to change the plan, but you need to be able to plan for that. Please make sure you're frugal because frugality not cleanliness is next to godliness. Use free and open source resources whenever you can. Do the legal for legwork yourself as much as possible. Don't be afraid to ask for help. And prototype, throw away, prototype, test, and produce. So that's the end of my talk. And now we can open it up to questions. Hi, again, I had some problem to come back on the stage, but don't worry if you want to uh, close your share screen and so so that. Uh, oh, yes, okay, close the share so, screen. So, uh, as I said at the beginning, if you have any questions, you can do it through the Q&A on the right part of the screen and uh, you can uh, raise your hand. There is a haze rent. Just a second. So thank you very much, John, uh, for your presentation. Thank you very much to uh, Linux Professional Institute uh, that is uh, associated events uh, to Open Expo Virtual Experience. And uh, thanks to, to, to them, uh, you are here today with us. So thank you very much. So uh, let's receive uh, Etienne Jana for a question.
Hey, John. Hi. Hey. Hi. Hello. Yeah, just go on, please. Thanks. So um, I was listening to your presentation, and and um, you mentioned it, you you were mentioning about uh, starting businesses based on open source projects. Um, I have a question specifically regarding that. Do, do you know, in your experience, or have you noticed recently a trend? of business models that tend to work better uh, with open source projects. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, uh, subscrip subscription based or any type of specific business model that works better uh, with open source projects than, than, than the rest of them. Sure, I can give you a couple examples of those that I've seen through my, my years in the business. Uh, there was a man who owned a company very close to my house here in New Hampshire who had an extremely large closed source product. And he only had five engineers. And what he would do is he would have those five engineers add new things to his closed source product. But at the same time, he was having customers ask him to port his product to different operating systems, to different hardware platforms. And his engineers could only do one or the other. He didn't have enough either revenue or engineers to do both. So he started studying his product. And he said, you know, if I take the huge amount of my product and make that open source and create a community around it, then the community will maintain that huge open source piece of product. At the same time, the community will do porting to different operating systems as they need it. And I will refocus my engineers on creating little pieces of new functionality that are very important to new to large customers, large customers. So he set up a server and it, it, that's a, the important part. He used his own server because then he could see who is downloading the free software of his product. And if they were small companies like mom and pop who who liked that free software, he would say, congratulations, you know. But as they got bigger, or if their names were places like the, the government or the military, he would call them up and say, I see you're using my software. You know, if you use these pieces, it'll make it a lot easier for you to do that. And so he cut down on his engineering he cut down on his cost of sales. Cost of sales to a proprietary product is typically 36% of what your of what your revenue is. So, you know, he cut that down to 5%. And he got more revenue than ever because more people started using his software. And as as as, as those customers grew, they were more likely to buy those proprietary pieces. You may be aware of Blender. Blender started off as a proprietary closed source product. The company went out of business. The users decided to buy the intellectual property and make it an open source project. And it, then they started, they created a foundation around it. And the foundation started making money through uh, selling, you know, training classes, books, and stuff like that. And Blender today is better than ever. Uh, there's a company, it's called Project.net. It is a project management system. It's very complex. The company that made it was only selling about two licenses per quarter. I mean, maybe a month. Two licenses a month. The licenses were... Uh, $2,000 a piece, and they were going out of business. So they sold it to a friend of mine, and he said, what happens if I make this open source? I give away the software. Because what he noticed was, even after the people bought the $2,000 license, 60% of them bought training and updates because it was a very <laughs> complex package. He made it open source and 2,000 people a month pulled the software down. And 60% of them bought training and support. 
So he made more money than ever. This is why you have to really understand what your product is. And you have to understand what your customer base would be. You have to understand your business plan. And if people do not understand that, whether they're closed source or open source, they're going to go out of business. And a lot of people say to me, Mad Dog, you know, companies, big companies don't go out of business. That's why I buy, you know, my, my software from here, or my software from there. And to those people, I can only say the words Enron, the largest energy company in the world, Kodak, one of the largest camera companies in the world. Digital Equipment Corporation, the second largest computer company in the world. All of these went out of business, some of them so fast, it was breathtaking. Enron went out of business in about, uh, oh, wait a minute. it was a telecommunications company, Nortel. Boom. They went out of business so fast. I, I maybe John has got a, a little trouble in uh, the in the live. Do you hear me? Please just tell from the chat. I see that uh, Etienne is moving, is still moving. So I think everything's still okay. Uh, well, uh, we don't have time for more questions right now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, John. And uh, you can uh, see John after this on on the tables. Uh, and uh, you can ask questions directly uh, on on each table uh, between conference and conference. And right now at uh, 5 uh, p.m. Central Europe time, we will receive uh, Marc Chantreux uh, with the title Support Snowden, Save the Planet and Fix the It. And uh, uh, on the other room, the Oracle room, uh, there will be Alberto Marti, past, present, and future of Open Nebula, expanding open source from the private cloud to edge. Just see that uh, John is going back. I was yes. just closing the uh, closing the, this conference, uh, just telling people that uh, they can ask you question in the private rooms oh. uh, just uh, at the end of the conference. I don't know if you want to add something before leaving uh, the conference. Well, just to finish this last thought, there are, there are books and articles, many books and articles about companies that used open source to do business. And you can find them by searching on the net. Most of the companies like Red Hat have success story areas where they talk about people using free software to improve their business and even making products. So, you know, yes, there are many times where using open source helps you make a better product and a better business. Okay, thank you very much and uh, for uh, all the for your time, for your knowledge, and thank you very much for the audience. So, if you 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 will be here now for uh, a couple of minutes, uh, John. Sure, no? sure, I'll stay here. Okay. So you can uh, find uh, uh, John in the tables and ask him directly if you have any question. And uh, there are uh, folks from uh, Linux uh, Professional Institute. If you want to ask them about the LPI and LPI exam, LPI exam, uh, because there is a 50% discount right now for Open Expo Virtual Experience. So thank you very much, John, and thank you very much, Etienne, uh, for the question too. Thank you, guys. Sure. Thank bye, you. bye, bye, bye.